So for about two years. I went out through a WWCR, Worldwide Christian Radio, in Nashville, Tennessee, all over the world. Well, Dave made some probably questionable comments, I'm not going to say didn't, about uh, Mr. Art Bell. And as a result of those comments he made, I didn't say anything. We're going to go over the script very carefully in just a few minutes. Uh, as a result of those comments, uh, Art Bell uh, went public and said he was going to go off the air because of uh, my radio show and because of the comments that uh, Hinkson and I had made. And uh, he sued uh, WWCR, he sued me, and he sued uh, Dave Hinkson. I'm going to take you step by step through that lawsuit. And then at the end, I'm going to give you an opinion as to what I think the real story is. So, you want to turn that? This is um, uh, the April 1st announcement by Art Bell, right up here, uh, that uh, he made on his show about going off the air. On May the 16th of the year 1997, my son Art Bell IV was kidnapped, transported across state lines, and raped by a substitute teacher from his own high school. The assailant was HIV positive. My son was a minor. He was only 16 years old. Next. I'm going to work you pretty good there, partner. I'm training. <laughs> and then he goes on uh, later. He says, Ted Gunderson, retired FBI agent, along with Dave Hinkson and the assistance of others, aired a broadcast which incredibly, absolutely, incredibly accused me of committing the very same crime my son had suffered, child molestation. The program further stated that I had paid to cover up the indictment, and it goes on a little more information. And then this broadcast was on WWCI, Worldwide uh, Shortwave Radio in Nashville, Tennessee. The station has been described by newspapers and civic-minded organizations as one of the country's leading broadcasters of hate radio. Next. And then uh, on the next page, he's, this is again, this is his broadcast. Uh, the reality uh, that after suffering the fate of my son's only molestation, I now stand destined to be tainted for life as a child molester, has proven simply too much to bear. God knows I have tried. Well, as a result of that, flip it off just a minute. As a result of uh, Art Bell going off the uh, radio, uh, all of a sudden, there's all kinds of information coming out on the Internet uh, about uh, this terrible fellow, Ted Gunderson. Uh, there is a, a site set up about Hate Ted Gunderson. And, uh, of course, you know that Art Bell is uh, probably ranks fifth among listeners in the United States uh, behind uh, Oprah Winfrey and uh, David Stearns. Isn't that his name, David Stearns? Uh, Howard Stearns, I can't, I, turn, I turned him on once and I had to turn him off right away. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Republican, the, the spokesperson for the Republican Party, uh, Rush Limbaugh, right, okay. <laughs> and uh, anyway, he's right up there close to him. He has between 13 and 15 million listeners. So all of a sudden I'm the villain, I'm a villain. And in addition to that, we have the Internet working in their behalf, if you want to say that they're working for that purpose. This is an example of what appeared on the internet. Lights out, please. I think what Ted Gunderson and his right-wing freak haters did to Art Bell is disgusting. Gunderson has his uh, particular theories about Area 51, and I guess he doesn't like Art Bell uh, diving too deeply into the issues. And it goes on and says, I have posted an expose of Ted Gunderson, the informer. They think I'm an FBI informant, I guess. The FBI agent who orchestrated this hit on Art, please read the data dump on this guy Gunderson and you will see that Gunderson's conduct was designed to destroy Art Bell. Gunderson is a powerful big creep and I've gone out of my way to expose his activity. Okay, turn, turn it back off. Yeah, that's all right. Off. So uh, with that, uh, Art Bell's lawyer a fellow named Fox, out of Los Angeles, goes on the Good Morning America show on May the 31st, 
and mentions I'm a former FBI agent and mentions Dave Hinkson that suggested that Art Bell, uh, and he says that we suggested Art Bell was a child molester. He used the word suggested and uh, accused me of uh, being in charge of, of running a smear campaign against Art Bell, accused me of conspiracy, and said that an unnamed uh, financier was behind the plot. In addition to that, over the next several months, Art Bell himself goes on the air, before he went off the air, by the way. He went on, then off, then back on. And on September the 30th, May the 27th, June the 1st, July the 1st, oh, this is 99, 98, August 30th, 99, September 7, 99, uh, September 6, 99, 6 and 7, the same days, uh, April 1, 2000, April 20, 2000, and he makes uh, such comments as uh, Ted Gunderson has accused me of being a child molester. Also, um, there's a fellow named a Ghost Wolf, and he's been a guest on Art Bell's show. And uh, I don't know where Ghost Wolf came from, but we'll get into a little bit about him in just a few minutes. In addition to this, uh, Siegel, the fellow who replaced Art Bell, on his show on April the 28th, accused me of being a person who uh, said that I that have information or that I have documentation that uh, Art Bell is a child molester. In addition, Art Bell was on Extra TV on June the 7th, 1999, and uh, so on and so forth. On the show on September the 16th and 17th, Art Bell said, uh, Oates apologized, that was another lawsuit that he was involved in, out of San Diego, and he'd been a guest, I guess, on Art Bell's show also. But Ted Gunderson doesn't have the decency to apologize. He never offered to go on the air to uh, provide an apology. Okay, let's turn it back on. In addition to this, we now have People Magazine in the act. We have Extra TV. We have Good Morning America. And they put out an article next. And here's what they say. Then, in December 1997, rumors began circulating about the talk host himself. Ted Gunderson, a former FBI agent turned small-time radio host. I thought I was pretty good myself. I don't <laughs> Small-time radio host. Uh, and Dave Hinkson, a guest on the Gunderson Show on WWCR in Nashville, uh, Tennessee, alleged that Bell had paid uh, hush money to cover up an arrest for child molestation in Nevada's Nye County, a claim unequivocally denied by authorities. Bell has said he received several death threats after the rumored charges against him became public and is suing Gunnarsson and Hinkson for slander. $60 million, by the way. Okay. I took offense to the Time Magazine article, I mean People Magazine, excuse me, and I wrote a letter June the 5th, in regards to the article, People Magazine and so forth, entitled so-and-so, the writer alleged that Art Bell paid hush money to cover up an arrest for child molestation. Please refer to the uh, enclosed court transcript exhibit A of the radio conversation, which is the basis for the lawsuit. As you can see, I did not make this statement. On the other hand, Mr. Bell, prior to going off the air, repeatedly stated on his shows that I accused him of being a child molester. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, not true. Exhibit A contains the only comments I've ever made about our bill. I'm an honest public, uh, I am an honest public figure and need to be protected. I have the right to have the truth printed about me. Please print a retraction in the next issue. And uh, turn that off just a minute. I uh, I uh, received a letter back said they wouldn't uh, print a retraction, which uh, is par for the course. And. Uh, and then, um, at this point, I think that what I should do is I should go over the transcript of the radio show. This is the conversation on the radio show. It was uh, uh, 121 seconds long, by the way. After discussion between Ted Gunderson and Dave Hankson regarding the case of Miss Linda Wiegand, who has accused her ex-husband of custody in a custody fight of molesting and raping her two young boys. The program went to a station break. The following is a transcript of the broadcast after the break. That's me, Ted Gunderson, right? 
We're back, and my guest today is Dave Hinkson. By the way, we were talking about, Dave was on there about health. He wasn't even on there about these topics. But the Linda Wiggins case did come up. Uh, I'm going to tell you something, Ted, I thought was interesting. You do a lot of research. You're an investigator, right? Right. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm just getting over a cold. <clears throat> Dave Hinkson, okay. If I saw some paperwork or somebody credible said that they saw some paperwork, but we didn't have copies of it in our hands uh, pertaining to an indictment that had been squashed pursuant to a payola, how would you verify that? And I said, well, I'd go to the courts. Hinkson then said, okay, Art Bell, it's my understanding he recently paid to cover up his indictment. Now, I can't prove it, but it was a credible source. Can you do a little research for me on that? By the way, his source was in the district attorney's office. Or he told me later. Uh, me. Yes. Uh, let's uh, talk to, we'll, well, we can talk. Uh, what court district is it in? He says, Pahrump. That's in Nevada, of course. And then I say, well, the record should be right there in Pahrump. And he says, I was told, okay, that he bought his way out of it. And then I said, well, then, if he bought his way out of it, there is a good possibility that the right person was paid off and the records have disappeared. Hinkson then says, I won't say any more uh, than it has to do with the subject you're talking about, uh, Wigan. I said, oh, that's interesting. Now I'll tell you about Art Bell. That's, and, I, and he says, he's not friendly towards me. Uh, and I'm not saying too much here, am I? And at the point I should have said, yeah, but I didn't. Uh, so let me tell you about, uh, we tried to get him to take Linda Wigan and put her on the show. And then he says, that's uh, why he won't. And I said, what's happened? What happened was, I had his home phone number, and I called, and his wife said, we'll, uh, well, he's asleep. He'll be up in an hour, and I said, have him call me. I'd never talked to Art Bell in person, but I did have his home phone number from one of my sources. Uh, and that was about 10 days ago. I haven't heard from him yet. So I gave the phone number to Linda Wiegand, and she called. And I said, oh, uh, you know, I'd appreciate it if you put me on your show. We've got to protect our children. I need to get my child out from behind that situation. And he got mad and hung up on her. And then Dave says, uh-huh. Then I said, she called him back and said, people don't hang up on me. And I said, I will not put you on my, and he said, excuse me, I will not put you on my show until you tell me who gave you, gave my home phone number. And so she called me and I said, well, tell Art Bell that I gave the home phone number to you. Uh, she said she told him and she hadn't heard from him since. Then Dave comes in. Well, the only thing I'll say about this so-called indictment, and I'm not a, a, accusing, I uh, want listeners to call Art Bell and ask him to his face, were you indicted? Did you cover it up, Art? I'm not accusing him. I'm just telling you uh, a, a credible source gave the stuff to me and then so on and so forth. Then I said, you need to get all that. You need to. And then he says, I'm uh, asking you to prove my hearsay. Uh, that's what I'm telling you is correct. Okay, listen, we have a caller, Ruth, from West Virginia. Okay, uh, turn it off. Lights. Uh, that was a to total sum and substance of the conversation on the radio show. Um, so, uh, then uh, there's a, a court battle, and uh, I'm told uh, not to uh, discuss the case by my attorney. Of course, I knew better than to discuss it with anybody. And uh, so I keep my mouth shut. And uh, there's the manipulations, and uh, there are depositions on both sides. Uh, Art uh, Bell is deposed, and I'm deposed. Uh, and uh, then uh, turn the light on there. Um, I do my research, of course, and I need to find out about what happened to Art Bell the fourth. This is these are legal documents involving Brian Eugene Lepley who uh, is uh, the person who supposedly raped Art Bell Jr., or the fourth, I should say. And this is the appeal. By the way, he was tried and convicted and uh, sentenced to life in prison. And the accusations were that he uh, forcibly raped Art Bell the fourth, had HIV, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is the legal document that reverses that decision. And this is what the court said. We conclude that appellant... Brian Eugene Lepley's conviction for sexual assault 
must be reversed because the district court allowed the state to argue to the jury that Lepley's victim could not consent to the sexual act unless the victim was aware of Lepley's HIV positive status. And then it goes on, the records show that the victim of the sexual assault charge consented to have a sexual encounter with Lepley. In this case, Lepley did not even uh, affirmatively deceive his victim, but merely did not mention his HIV status at all. For these reasons, we conclude that Lepley cannot be convicted of sexual assault merely because he failed to disclose his HIV positive status. For these reasons, we reverse Lepley's conviction for assault sexual assault and remand this case for retrial. Okay, now just turn it off. So he wasn't raped and he wasn't taken against his force to California as was claimed and it's one big lie. Art, I'm sorry for Art Bell Sr. and for Art Bell Jr. or the fourth, whatever his Roman numeral is, because nobody likes to do something like this or to even make something like this public. But uh, this, these are facts that Art Bell put out uh, as fact, and they are not fact. Uh, this was uh, sex by consent. And um, I don't normally go around, you know, spreading this information about anybody, even Art Bell the fourth or Art Bell Sr., but this is what happened on the case. And I think, you know, you should be aware of the truth. Uh, and... Uh, so then my, my attorneys, fortunately, folks, I had insurance, liability insurance. Otherwise, I don't know what I would have done because I live on a shoestring. Every dime I make uh, goes into the, uh, the issues that we're discussing here today, not the Art Bell lawsuit, but these other issues, the contrails, the chemtrails, whatever you want to call them, and trying to expose the corruption in our government. Uh, I work on numerous cases. I have for the last 22 years, ever since I retired in 1979, uh, uh, pro bono. People can't afford uh, my fee. If, if they can't afford, I charge them. If they can't, I still help them as best I can. But fortunately, I did have life insurance. I mean, not life but liability insurance. So, and fortunately, uh, we picked a very good attorney in Nashville, Tennessee. The court case was uh, tried in Nashville. The papers were filed in Nashville because that's where WWCR is located. So um, my attorneys, in uh, looking at the facts and at the transcript uh, of what actually was said during my radio show, said there is no uh, case here for Art Bell against Ted Gunderson. So they filed for a summary judgment. Now, I'm sure most of you know what a summary judgment is, but in case you don't, here's what a summary judgment is. My, my attorneys go in, file papers, say there's no justification for this lawsuit. We want the charges dismissed. And then they have oral arguments. And this is what happened. And I was very comfortable uh, with the fact, and in my opinion, I didn't think there'd be any problem getting these charges dismissed. However, two days before the oral arguments, uh, the opposing side uh, submits an affidavit from one Kurt Billings. I don't know if you know Kurt Billings or not. I had only met him one time. That was in November of 19, a um, year ago last November, it would be uh, November of 1999. Uh, at that time, uh, Bryce Taylor, whose daughter uh, is Kelly Ford, and actually Bryce uh, wrote a couple of books about thanks for the memory of mind control victim. Bryce Taylor is working with her daughter trying to uh, straighten her out. Uh, she had her out of the institution, was working uh, with me. I was trying to help her. Uh, they were in L.A. They had some security problems there. Uh, and Bryce called me and said, Ted, we need your help. I drove to L.A. And then I drove them up to Las Vegas, where I live right now. Uh, Sue, or Bryce Taylor, whatever you want to call her, Sue Ford is her real name, I rented a house, and uh, I put special locks on the house and so on and so forth. And... I slept on the couch for two months in front of the door. And um, because of the problems that Sue was having with uh, Kelly, she was looking for a deprogrammer. Sue and Kelly are, are both MK Ultra mind control sex slave victims. Again, uh, Sue wrote the book, Thanks for the Memory, under the name Bryce Taylor. It's back there on my desk, by the way. Just two copies left. 
So uh, Sue said, I need your help. And, uh, and she said, I have Kurt Billings coming. He's a D programmer, and uh, he's going to work with uh, Kelly. So um, as a matter of fact, this is around Thanksgiving, and I fixed a nice Thanksgiving meal. I enjoy cooking, by the way. It's, it gets my mind off of all this. And uh, Kurt Billings rolled in, and uh, the first thing uh, that uh, Sue said to Kurt was, you know, I, I know you're good at computers, and my computer has a problem on it. Would you take a look at it? Well, he sat down for an hour and a half and messed with the computer. We found out later he erased all her programs. Um, then, he's in and out for about a day or two, and uh, we go out in the backyard, Sue and uh, Kurt Billings and his wife, and he asked me, what about the Art Bell lawsuit? And I said, as I said to Dean, I cannot discuss the case. It's in litigation. That's all I said. Now, I'm going to come forward to the summary judgment, oral arguments, right? Two days before the oral argument, summary judgment, in comes an affidavit from Kurt Billings. Okay, flip around. And this is what Mr. Billings says. In December 1999, I was in Las Vegas to attend a convention. About a week before the convention, I was at the home of Sue Ford. Also present were my wife, Leanne Billings, and Ted Gunderson. When Art Bell's name was brought up, Mr. Gunderson said Art Bell is a child molester and that he raped his own son. Mr. Gunderson also stated that Mr. Bell has been indicted for these crimes. Finally, Mr. Gunderson claimed he had pictures proving Art Bell is a child molester. I told Mr. Gunderson I didn't believe he had pictures of Art Bell or anyone else. Mr. Gunderson stated the pictures were in the trunk of a car in New Mexico and he could get his hands on them if he needed to. When we pressed him further, uh, he stated the pictures were really in a cave in Colorado. And then we pressed him again. Gunnarsson stood up, walked toward the kitchen, and admitted he did not have, actually have any pictures at all. To me, this is a clear example of Mr. Gunnarsson maliciously and knowingly slandering Art Bell. Mr. Gunnarsson made his assertions in a serious manner, and he intended for all of us to believe that he was what he was saying. Fortunately, did not, we did not accept this serious and destroying lies as easily as any others. Well, that wasn't enough. In comes a affidavit from his wife. This is, uh, the date of this is April the 21st. You put the next one. On. So then we get an affidavit at the same time, two days before oral arguments, from his wife, Leanne Billings. I'm 18 years old, et cetera, et cetera. In December 99, my husband, Kurt Billings, and I went to the home of Sue Ford in Nevada. Ted Gunnarsson was at Mrs. Ford's home. When Art Bell's name was brought up, Mr. Gunnarsson said Art Bell had been indicted for raping his own son. Mr. Gunnarsson also claimed he had pictures proving Art Bell had molested children. We told Mr. Gunnarsson straight out we did not believe him. Gunnarsson then said these pictures were in the trunk of a car in New Mexico. When we questioned his outrageous allegations, he stated the picture really in a cave in Colorado. We then pressed him again. Mr. Gunnarsson finally admitted he did not, ha did not have any pictures. Well, that isn't enough. Again, that's uh, April 21st. Okay, turn the, cut the light. Yeah. I got this guy working real good here. I'll put him to work for you, Dean. <laughs> so that isn't good enough, right? The day before the oral arguments on summary judgment, in comes an affidavit from a fellow named Ghost Wolf. Okay, let's turn around. 18 years old, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. See, Robert Ghost Wolf. I understand he's actually from New York or New Jersey someplace. That's an Indian name he gave himself. In late 1997, I was delivering a series of seminars in Las Vegas. One of these seminars was hosted by a radio uh, disc jockey, C.C. Uh, Walden, Mrs. Uh, Walden gave me a business card that read Ted L. Gunderson and Associates and told me that Ted Gunderson wanted to speak with me about appearing on his radio show. I have attached Mr. Gunderson's card to this affidavit. By the way, I passed my card out to anybody. It's on my table back there, so that's no big deal. Shortly thereafter, I called Mr. Gunderson. He asked me to be a guest on his show, which is not true. I've never asked him to be a guest on the show. Uh, which, he said, is broadcast in numerous states and originates out of Tennessee. Mr. Gunderson then said that I ought not to be on Art Bell's show. I asked him why not. And by the way, he's been a regular, go uh, regular ghost. He's been a regular... Uh, <laughs> he might be a ghost, right? 
He's been a regular uh, participant on Nardwell's show uh, on numerous occasions, I understand. Uh, I asked him why not. His response was along the following lines. He's not an effing American, okay, and I'm going to take his, this uh, SOB down. I asked Mr. Gunners what he meant by his response, uh, quote, I'm going to take him off the air, end quote. And uh, this, by the way, this is important because this date is February 1997. And my radio talk show was December the 9th, 1997. So this was roughly 10 months prior to my radio talk show. Okay, cut the, cut, turn the lights on. Now, I'm sure you get the significance of this. Okay, it's very obvious that they're trying to paint a picture of me conspiring to bring Art Bell out, down and off the air, which is not true. As a matter of fact, when I had my radio talk show, one of my uh, callers years ago, and this has been back in 86, 96 to 97, asked me the question, what do you think of our bill? And I said, well, I think he puts out some good information. I don't know that much about Area 51 or about the UFOs and ETs and all that, but I said, uh, you know, he serves a cause. I, I actually can dig that conversation up. I've never said an unkind word about Mr. Art Bell. Never. Okay. Okay, so that's, that's, this is the uh, Ghost Wolves again. This is the 24th. Note there, okay. And uh, then uh, we have uh, Art Bell, the plaintiff. And um, cut the light just a minute. I got a little ahead of myself. So then, of course, uh, we uh, lost the summary judgment. Uh, the judge said, uh, I'm very suspicious of these three affidavits, but uh, in view of the fact that they are here, they're a matter of court record. I cannot ignore them, and we have to continue with the case. So I lost that, uh, that round. Uh, then my insurance company and WWCR and Art Bell's lawyers and Art Bell all got together and decided they were going to have a mediation uh, period. And they mediated, and my attorney calls me, and he says, here's, here's what they've offered. They've, want, they've offered to, they want money, of course, and uh, they want an apology from you, and they want you to sign a confidentiality agreement that you will not discuss the case, and uh, so on and so forth. And I told them, I said, look, uh, I'm not signing anything. As far as I'm concerned, this is blackmail, and uh, I don't care what my insurance company does, what our bill does, what our bill's attorneys do. What WWCR does, I'm not going to be victim of blackmail. That's just exactly what it was, in my opinion. So they all mediated, and they reached a conclusion, and uh, they reached some sort of a settlement. Again, confidential settlement. I don't have any idea how much money was involved, but I do know there was some money involved. And then the next document we're going to look at is the dismissal of the complaint amended order of dismissal, and it goes on and says, uh, lawsuits dismissed with prejudice, and so on and so forth. Next. And then, Mr. Art Bell, on October the 20th, 2000, uh, put out um, his statement, official statement, on December the 9th, 1990, this is the result of the mediation, by the way, 1997, Ted Gunderson broadcast a radio transmitted show transmitted by WWCR, in which a guest by the name of Dave, Hink Dave Hinkson made certain statements that may have left the listening audience with the belief that former late radio uh, night radio host Art Bell had been charged with child molestation. On October 15, 1998, Mr. Bell filed a defamation suit in the circuit court for Davidson County against uh, Tennessee, uh, Gunderson, Hinkson, and the radio station, and so on and so forth. Mr. Gunderson and the ownership of WWCR have apologized to Mr. Bell and his family for the statements made by Mr. Hinkson. Sadly, in point of view, it was Mr. Bell's son who was victimized by a high school teacher who is now serving a jail sentence for his crimes. Upon receipt of this apology and previous retraction, Mr. Bell agreed to a confidential settlement releasing Mr. Gunderson and the radio station. Mr. Bell looks forward to putting this matter behind him and moving on with his life. Cut. Okay. I didn't apologize. I want you to know that. Did not apologize. There is no apology necessary. Um, 
So, let's see what we have left on there. Oh, yes. You, no, okay. Turn it off just a minute. Oh, you, this is this takes the cake. What I'm going to show you next. <laughs> what I'm going to tell. What I'm going to show you next is absolutely unbelievable. This whole lawsuit is unbelievable. But what I'm going to show you next will really will really make you surprised. You know that old saying? Who was Jimmy Durante used to say? Everybody wants to get into the act, right? Well, of course, most of you people are too, old, too young for that. But uh, guess what? After the settlement, it was so easy and so simple for Mr. Bell to grab some money that Mr. Grosswoof decided he would take a, take a shot at my insurance company. Okay, let's, let's look at this. You won't believe this one. This is to Mr. Cox, my attorney. This is, uh, put the letterhead down so we can get Fox and Spillane. Uh, those are uh, Art Bell's uh, attorneys. And Mr. Ghostwolf is the person uh, who's uh, written this letter. Or the Fox, the, the, the attorneys have written the letter on behalf of Ghostwolf. We've been retained by Robert Ghostwolf in connection with the well documented campaign of defamation and torturous interference that Ted Gunnerson has been and continues to be an integral part of. Throughout this campaign, Ted Gunnerson and his co-conspirators asserted in words or substance, among other things, that Ghost Wolf is a fraud, that Robert Ghost Wolf is not authentically Metis, that Robert Ghost Wolf has engaged in uh, uh, plagiarism, that Robert Ghost Wolf uses illegal drugs, that Robert Ghost Wolf has committed a crime of arson, that there are warrants out for the arrest of Robert uh, Ghostwolf, that Robert Ghostwolf is a convicted felon, and that Robert Ghostwolf has physically abused women and children. Additionally, this campaign has accused Mr. Ghostwolf's wife of being involved with pornography and prostitution. These false and vicious accusations have caused tremendous pain and suffering for Mr. Ghostwolf and his entire family. These statements, many of which constitute defamation per se, were made in the in intentional and targeted manner with the clear purpose of damaging Mr. Ghostwood's reputation and his relationship with existing and potential clients. I don't even know what he does, by the way. As such, this campaign of defamation exposes Ted Gunners not only to liability, but to substantial punitive damages. In addition to the above-mentioned defamation and torturous interference, Mr. Robert Ghostwood has also received threats of death and bodily harm. It also documented that the campaign against Robert Ghostwolf intensified after his sworn testimony on behalf of Art Bell earlier this year. Both of these factors would expose the scope of a potential lawsuit to include claims under state and federal racketeer influence and corrupt organization act. It's called the RICO Act, by the way. They use it against the mob. The FBI uses it against the mob regularly. The purpose of this letter is, one, to put Ted Gunnerson on notice that Robert Ghostwolf it tends to pursue all legal remedies available to him, including the filing of a lawsuit, to compensate him for the damages he has suffered, and two, uh, to demand that Ted Gunnerson immediately <coughs> cease and desist from publishing and abetting future defamatory statements about Robert Goswift and defa and I I'll get that later. And to demand <laughs> to, to demand a full retraction of all defamatory statements uh, made against Robert Goswift, including but not limited to the ones enumerated in the preceding paragraph. Because the statements are made of such a nature that the damages flowing from them are not susceptible to full mitigation, Mr. Goswift intends to file a complaint irrespective of any correction and retraction your client may issue. Ted Gunnerson and the other defendants who will be named by Mr. Goswift's uh, complaint have uh, falsely accused him of the most heinous crimes, putting at jeopardy his reputation and livelihood, his life, and the cause to which he has devoted himself throughout his last 30 years. As you may know, juries have awarded plaintiffs, and it goes on and talks. Well, I guess I'm going to get a million-dollar lawsuit on that one. Uh, he's willing to consider a settlement of this matter. Yes, I'm sure of that. At this stage early, only if there is immediate and permanent cessation of further defamatory activities, along with meaningful corrections and tractions, and so on and so forth. If Mr. Gunnerson is willing to discuss settlement of these terms, Mr. Goldfuss will agree to, file a, to, uh, to forego filing a complaint and so on and so forth. If you do not represent Mr. Gunnerson in this matter, please forward the letter to the appropriate person. Uh, nothing set forth herein is intended to waive any rights and so on and so forth. Uh, give me the date of that letter, will you? Originally. It's, um, 
October 24 last year. Okay. So Mr. Goldsworth swiftly files another letter and um, hoping to get something from my insurance company, I'm sure. Uh, let me just say this right here now because I'm sure that somehow my lecture today will be put in the hands of Art Bell and also Mr. Goswoof. I've never accused Mr. Goswoof of any of those things. I don't even know who the man is. I wouldn't know him if he's sitting in the audience. And for all I know, he might be in the third or fourth row here right now. And I don't remember ever speaking to the man. Uh, but um, those are the facts of what happened in the Ted Gunderson Art Bell lawsuit. Now, why? Why? Does anybody want to venture forth why? Yes. You, okay, you go over to the uh, go over to the mic over there. We're going to get a professional opinion here because I know this one. My name is Vernell, and I would say that they were trying very hard to shut down WWCR. They consider that a real danger in this country because they're teaching the truth. And who else are they trying to shut down? Probably you. Absolutely. I, I don't think there's any question about it. I must be doing something right, because I have never been attacked like that before. And um, I think it's a, my personal opinion, and I, I'm entitled to an opinion. I think that it was a campaign to uh, take over WWCR, to shut them down, and also to destroy my name and reputation. And uh, also, uh, because Art Bell was the fourth most popular talk show host in America, 13 to 15 million people on his night show, uh, he had that old contract, remember? The old contract. He just put together a brand new contract. One third, I think, less uh, advertising and more money for Art Bell. Now, Oprah Winfrey and the rest of them make millions, and I think Art Bell feels like he's entitled to make millions. So I suspect that maybe uh, he, uh, this is orchestrated, uh, that, that being uh, one of the reasons. Um, I, um, I've been under attack for, for some 22 years now, and it doesn't bother me in the least. I just keep going forward. I just keep doing my work. I just keep putting out the truth. And I challenge anybody to come up with any documentation uh, that is a derogatory in nature uh, that uh, they could use against me. Um, when I was in the FBI 27 and a half years, one of the... Um, campaigns I was involved in was to investigate the Black Panther Party in New Haven, Connecticut. And I have to admit, as the leader of my squad and number two man in the state at that time, that uh, I was the instigator and the brains behind uh, uh, moving against the Panthers uh, in, the, in the state. And uh, we did a lot of, coin, they call Cointel Pro. Cointel Pro is, uh, you know, disinformation. And as you recall, uh, Congress was very critical of the FBI for years because of the disinformation program that they put out. Uh, it is effective, and it was effective in uh, you know, eliminating the Black Panthers and reducing them to uh, an ineffective organization itself. Of course, many of them ended up in jail because of the murder of a young black, Alex Rackley, who was a New York police informant. They brought him up to New Haven put him spread eagle on a bed for a day and a half, tortured him, and then took him out and shot him. Um, uh, but uh, that was probably the one thing in the elimination of the Panther Party that the biggest mistake they made, because we were all over them, the FBI and the New Haven Police Department, and we raised all kinds of cane uh, over that. And there was a trial, and three of them were convicted, the three that shot him. Uh, Bobby Seale was tried, he was acquitted. Uh, the three that... Uh, shot Alex Rackley, one of them said that Bobby Steele had given the orders and so on and so forth. That's another case. But I, I mentioned this, this case because, uh, again, I was active in the disinformation program. I know how the disinformation program works. And, um, and it's kind of uh, amusing in a way that uh, when I get out of the FBI in 1979, and at that time I was in charge of Southern California, had over 700 personnel under my command, a $22.5 million budget, um, we started my own investigative firm, and uh, my, one of my first, in fact, my first major case was the Jeffrey R. McDonald case. He's a former Green Beret doctor, convicted of murdering his wife and two children at Fort Bragg, uh, 1970, February 17, 1970. And uh, he uh, had been tried and convicted in August of 1979. 
Some of his doctor friends came to me and asked if I would investigate the case he's innocent. I went and talked to Dr. McDonald and I told him, if you're innocent, fine. If you're guilty, I will not continue the investigation. I'm still working the case, by the way. The man is absolutely innocent. One of the first things you do in a case of this magnitude, or any case, you have to know the facts. You have to know all the details. So I reviewed all the court records. I reviewed all the transcripts, all the testimony. It took days to read everything of significance. You couldn't read all of them because they were thousands and thousands, or 100,000 pages, as a matter of fact, plus. And I learned that evidence was lost, stolen, destroyed, altered. Two FBI agents lied on the witness stand under oath. And being a Boy Scout type uh, in the Bureau, I was uh, uh, apple pie mother's, uh, you know, chivalry and baseball and all that sort of thing. That was my attitude and my demeanor in the FBI. And at one time, they were a great outfit. They were a very effective uh, investigative organization that's changed. Um, anyway, because of this, I couldn't believe it. And uh, so I went forth, and uh, long story short, I developed 19 new witnesses, including a signed confession from... If you know the case, the girl in the floppy white hat, Helena Stokely. Helena said that Dr. McDonald did not commit the crimes. They were committed by her satanic cult group. And uh, she gave me all details about who was in the house that night and what each person did. Uh, and then we had a second session. We went back to uh, North Carolina, and she showed us where the cars were and how she entered the door and all that sort of thing, which you have to do. And everything was recorded. Everything was on audio tape. And in one occasion, I put her on videotape. I called 60 Minutes. I said, I got a scoop for you. Come on down. Come on down. Then the TV show, isn't that when that they say, come on down? I said, come on down to South Carolina. We were in South Carolina at that time. And 60 Minutes sent Joe Wershbaugh down. And we did a taped interview for 60 Minutes. It was never aired, by the way. A confession by Helena. But long story short, I went public with this information. Uh, radio talk shows, TV shows. And I said, this man is innocent. And this girl, Helena Stokely, I have a confession from her. Her satanic cult group committed these crimes. I receive hundreds of phone calls after that over the next several months. People from all over the United States, Florida, Washington, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Texas, New England, telling me about satanic cults. And all these people... They were calling me and were giving me the same basic story. They told me about the ceremonies involved. Some of them actually came and talked to me and visited with me. Some of them gave me statements. Uh, some of them wrote, wrote to me. And all these people told the same basic story. And I said, what in the, what's going on here? From that point on, and then, of course, I began to be critical of the government. Then I developed information about an international child kidnapping ring operating in Nebraska, the Franklin cover-up case, under the auspices of a CIA covert operation in Washington, D.C., known as the Finders, okay, and developed information about a cowboy operation going into the White House under Reagan and Bush, um, and uh, went public with that. And then I developed information on the McMartin case in California. Um, the kids said that they were taken down through the tunnels, up in the trap door of the triplex next door, placed in cars, two, three, four-year-old kids, transported out in the community and prostituted. The authority went looking for uh, tunnels, couldn't find them. I had gained access to the tunnels in the spring of 1990, coordinated the project. We hired, uh, we, some of the parents and I hired um, an archaeologist from UCLA, Dr. Gary Stickle. We found the tunnels. The authorities couldn't find them, we found them. It cost about fifteen, fifty-five dollars to $60,000. I handled I coordinated, I handled the money and everything. But on, going back to the Nebraska case, the kids were being taken from Omaha to Sioux City, Iowa, 184 miles away in private limousines, flown in private jets from Sioux City, Iowa to Washington, D.C. for sex orgy parties with congressmen and senators. Yeah. Now, you know what happens then, don't you? Pictures, right? And what do you, what do, you do with the pictures? Hey, you better vote for my bill because otherwise, remember that little 14-year-old kid you were with last Friday? Okay, that's the story. Mass blackmail in Washington, D.C. I have the documentation. I know where the pictures are. And to be honest with you, they're above the 12,000 foot level in a cave in the state of Colorado. Okay? And someday we're going to go after those pictures. But in the meantime, and I'm building this up, because in the meantime, what do you think has happened to me? 
That's one thing. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> well, well, you know what else has happened? The smear campaign, right? What else has happened? I'm a drug dealer. There's a guy named Stu Webb. I tried to help Stu Webb out. He's from Denver area, I think. He lived with me for seven months. He didn't have any place to go. He came in. He said, I have no place to live, to sleep. Can I stay here for four days? He stayed for seven months. I fed him, clothed him, housed him, gave him cigarette money. Gave him money for his booze. He was a little bit of a drinker. Um, he gave him gas money. I, he ended up driving my everything. I gave him everything for the cause, right? Well, now, this last summer I was writing a book, and I, in order to get away from the telephone and all these letters and all that, I just isolated myself in the, with my daughter in L.A. and spent the whole summer right, working on this book. Stu Webb had access to my property, my condominium. I come home in August and I got 35 boxes of research missing. I got all kinds of personal property gone. And I file a police report and I say that Stu Webb's the number one suspect because number one, he had access to the property and number two, he had an automobile. And whoever uh, took those boxes couldn't ride out of there on a bicycle. But anyway, so Stu Webb is now putting out the word uh, that uh, I stole money from a trust, 150000 that uh, I'm a drug dealer, that I uh, was, uh, I gave Ollie North uh, orders on, on Iran-Contra and the drug operations in the e Europe and the Middle East. Uh, I was involved in uh, guns for drugs in Afghanistan. Uh, and the story goes on and on and on. And, uh, but I, I, I point that out. Now, I don't have, I don't have the connections to go on Good Morning America. By the way, our bell was on Good Morning America last Monday. I'm back. I don't have those kind of connections. I don't have the connections to get Mr. Cox, my attorney in Nashville, on Good Morning America, right? So what is this all about? I, I don't think there's any question about it. There's a conspiracy. Mr. Co Mr. Fox, Art Bell's attorney, went on Good Morning America and said there's a conspiracy that's being financed by against Art Bell by other people, I think it's just the opposite. I think it's just the other way around, okay? And I don't mind telling Art Bell that, and I don't mind telling Mr. Ghostwolf that, and I hope that tomorrow that this video or audio gets back to them immediately, because I'm ready for another lawsuit, you know? <laughs> this time it might be me suing them. But anyway, uh, this is a story on the Art Bell lawsuit. Uh, I kind of wrapped it up a little bit with some of my other work in the end. Uh, but this is the way it works. I, I was, that's ironic, as I said a few moments ago, I was very good at it when I was in the FBI, and now I'm a victim of it. So maybe that uh, turnabout's fair play, huh? I don't know. It's what, sir? Art Bell, I don't know. I'm just telling you the facts. Yeah, I'm just telling you what happened. And I'll back up anything. Well, I showed you the documentation. Okay, another question there. In view of your summary arguments, my question's perhaps irrelevant, but uh, before you started that, it occurred to me to ask, did any evidence service that surface that Mr. Bell et al. was a part of disinformation of the government? No, I can't say that. I don't know. I don't have any information on that. I can only, what I've done here, I know the facts. I think it's ironic that he can get on Good Morning America. I can't. I think it's ironic that he, we get People Magazine to make statements that aren't true. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I might mention this. Um, Art Bell, I've, I've heard, and I don't have a documentation of this, so I'm very careful what I'm saying now, that Art Bell's uncle is Warren Buffett. Do you know who Warren Buffett is? Warren Buffett, the kids in Nebraska on the Nebraska case, which involved a pedophile ring and uh, child kidnapping and all that, some of the kids have named Warren Buffett in that case. Yes. Yes. Uh, Wait may minute, I just to, ask you? you have to go to the uh, I want to say this to you. Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> this will just take a second. I want you to know that I live in California, and I listened to you when you were on the Art Bell Show, and I want to tell you something. I enjoyed you much more than Art Bell. <laughs> That's all I want to say. Well, thank you. <laughs> yes. Can you tell me what relationship the Bohemian Grove has with Satanism? Uh, the Bohemian Grove, there's, um, 
By the way, I'm going to um, I'm going to be discussing. Uh, I've got a three-hour workshop tonight, and I'm going to be uh, going into the documentation on Satanism and the Illuminati, control of the media. I have some fantastic documentation on how the media uh, uh, was controlled beginning in 1915, 85 years ago. I have part of the congressional record, February the 9th, 1917. Wherein it states that the J.P. Morgan interests, according to a congressman from Texas, bought 25 of America's leading newspapers and inserted their own editors in order to control the press in this country. Now, what do you think's happened in 40, in 85 years? We have Dan, what's his name, and uh, the rest of them uh, on controlling TV and radio. Yes, you'll have to go over there to the mic. I'm sorry. And while you're walking over there, uh, answer his question. The Bohemian Grove is a meeting place for some of these. High-level Illuminati members, Bilderbergs and uh, others, Council on Foreign Relations, um, Trilateral Commission, and I'll go into all of this tonight in my workshop. Uh, believe me, when I got out of the FBI, I, had, I was totally ignorant about what was going on behind the scenes. Now I'm pretty well uh, informed of it. I've actually testified in court as an expert on Satanism. Yes. Hi, it's wonderful to see you back, but this may not be such a minor point, but just for the accuracy, is it not today's show rather than... Good Morning America. It was with um, Katie Couric. Art Bell, you mean Monday? It was Katie Couric and... Um, oh, was it? Okay, well, the one, he was, uh, his lawyer was on Good Morning America. That okay. was Channel 13. It's a good day show, is that? What channel is that? What Five, network? NBC. NBC, okay. Well, he's got more clout than I thought he did. You get on ABC and NBC. Uh, any more questions? Well, you've been a very attentive audience, and I've certainly enjoyed appearing before you and... I guess that's it. See, see some of you tonight. Thank you very much. Oh, wait, let me, one other thing. One other thing I just want to mention. This is a book I have back there. It's brand new. It's why Johnny can't come home. It's the story of Johnny Gosh, a 12-year-old paper boy kidnapped off the streets by the Nebraska kidnapping gang, put into the pedophile porn pornographic ring, and he escaped along with another kid. They stole a car and escaped, and they're in hiding right now. This book is phenomenal. And I, I highly recommend it. If you're into this and you want to know about it, this book will tell you a lot. Thank you very much. What about, what happened?